I would like to start off by saying that I've never really been into the idea of the paranormal, nor the otherworldly. I thought them as nothing more than just stories meant to keep me and my brother from being bad kids. But ever since being stationed on a Marine Corps base in New Mexico, that has drastically changed. I'm a special agent in the military, meant I can't give away my rank, but I am an officer and a fairly young one at that, so I deal with a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes in the military that you don't hear about. I also do medical work due to me getting a degree in health sciences, so I can give support when needed on certain events that require it. The things on this base for the most part are very dull and plain. It's in the middle of nowhere, close to Navajo country, so there really isn't much to do. I even started to question why I had been assigned this duty, but that was until I was tasked with medical coverage for a 12 mile hike that would last for two days. And the beginning of the hike was uneventful. We made camp somewhere in a prairie full of vegetation under the desert night. It was my first time seeing the stars where little light pollution interfered. It looked beautiful, and I was lost in the beauty of it. It looked like something a renaissance artist would draw. My stargazing was interrupted by a loud conversation going on next to me. Dude, I swear that I saw something watching me go to the bathroom from beyond the prairie. It was sitting on something. Bro, come on off it if you're trying to scare me. It's not going to work this time. You guys already pranked me once. It was probably just an animal or something. That was no animal. It looked human. It stood on two feet and everything I'm telling ya. It walked just as we did. I think you've had too much to drink. Come on, we should go back to the tent with the rest of the guys. Yeah, maybe you're right. Let's go. Being the person that I was, I decided to walk out to where he had allegedly saw the thing, and I started to investigate. All I saw was a puddle of where he went to the bathroom. I quickly went from a puddle to a trail of it, leading back to the campsite. I let out a slight chuckle, and I was about to turn around when I saw something walking away in the distance. It was tall and pale with extremities reaching past its knees. Its body was slim, with fingers too long to be human. It walked slowly but methodically. I decided to follow it with my weapon in hand and I loaded and tailed the creature. For about a mile it led me to a cliffside where it took a seat on a rock. I ducked behind a large tree. I know you're out there. Come on out from your hiding spot. There's no use in hiding. The voice. It sounded like a man speaking through a microphone. It echoed when there was no possible way for it to echo. And it was deep. I spoke. How did you know I was here? And how long have you known? You pick up hints when you're sitting on a rock, enjoying a night of stars in the desert. And you look to your left, to see some guy staring at you while he's peeing. You should have seen the look on his face when I stared back. He ran away so fast with, you know what, running down his leg. And I knew that it would only be a matter of time until he told someone. I was joking around. I knew where on the map he was. It knew where guns were, and he could swear. This creature was no ordinary creature. He knew his way. He understood the concept of human interaction. I questioned him. Where did you come from? My friend, I come from the darkness. Uh, the darkness? You see, I was born in the darkness, molded by it. I didn't think I would see the light until I cut him off. Okay, that's enough. I've seen the dark night and you don't look like Bane to me. Fair enough. If I put some muscle on though and get juiced up, I bet I could. Yeah, okay, whatever. Sorry for ruining your night. You really shouldn't be watching people from a distance creepily. Well, your buddy shouldn't have been staring at me while taking a you-know-what. I tried to avoid eye contact. That's like using the stall next to someone in the bathroom when there are four more open, and looking him in the eye and starting a conversation, and then patting him on the back. Fair enough. 
Must have been pretty awkward. Very well, I'm glad you understand. You guys shouldn't be so careless out here. Other things more terrifying than me lurk in these deserts. What do you mean by other things? But before I could get an answer, I blinked and it was gone. That single encounter proved to me that I'd gotten myself into something that was only about to get more strange. The next day, we hiked back to base but something was wrong when we had called attendance. We noticed that two marines were missing. Myself and another marine officer named Chaska were tasked to go find them. Chaska was a pretty cool guy. He was from around here and he grew up on the Navajo reservation, so I knew that I was in good hands. We made our way to some caverns near the campsite where we assumed that the marines went. Telling from the footprints, which strangely turned into the look of something being dragged through the sand. I looked at Chaska and he was pale and he knew something bad had happened. We both exchanged worried looks and ventured further into the caves. It was a maze straight out of a Greek mythology book. With a fork in the middle, it was a confusing maze, and a situation where it is difficult to know which direction to take. Chaska spoke. Look man, I don't know what you believe in, but no matter what, you need to listen to me. From what I've seen so far, I think something dragged two full-grown marines into this cave, and did God knows what to them. So I'm going to give you this one rule and you have to follow it no matter what. If you hear me call your name, wait until I call it three times and not once. Not twice, three, you got it. Keep this road tied to you, I've tied it to a secure point in the front of the cave, so that we can find our way back. Got it. Just make sure your weapon is loaded and I'll go left and you go right. We parted ways and instantly, I felt lost and on edge of every drop of water made me look behind myself. Every stalagmite gave me a heart attack, almost making me draw my weapon. I made my way deeper into the cave when I started hearing whispers. I then heard my name, and I saw Chaska waving me on. I started walking towards him, but before I could take another step, I was pulled by my rope from behind and put behind a rock with a hand over my mouth. It was Chaska. He held a finger to his lips and we slid behind the rock with our weapons in hand. He motioned me to peek from behind the rock, and what I saw was something that defied reality. It was a large creature, as tall as a tree. The body was skeletal and deformed, with missing lips and toes and jagged teeth. Its breath was a strange hiss, its footprints full of blood and it ate any man, woman, or child who ventured into its territory. A foul stench was present in the air. An unseasonable chill proceeded with its approach. This creature was the Whitico. It is said the Whitico chose to possess a person instead, and then the luckless individual became a Whitico himself, hunting on those he had once loved and feasting upon their flesh. The strong sense of fear I felt was indescribable. This was not natural fear but powerful primitive, and the core of basic human emotion. That shot my adrenaline through the roof, making all six senses go wild. This was worst case scenario. I looked at Chaska to see if he would engage or stand down, but when our eyes met, he gave me the signal to wait. His eyes then highlighted with the thought of an idea, and he looked at me and pointed to the ceiling. There were sharp stalactites hanging from the ceiling. We both nodded. We looked up the ceiling and we were about to shoot when it spoke. Come out, come out, wherever you are, boys. I know you're out there. Come join your friends. And then started to mimic their voices and it didn't sound human at all. It sounded distorted and guttural. Our eyes both grew wide, and knowing the outcome of our fallen comrades, Chaska then counted to three using his fingers. One, two, three. We let loose fire on the stalactites. They came raining down on the creature, impaling it through its whole body. Run! Chaska yelled. We booked it back to the entrance, following the rope trail. 
We broke the cave entrance and the thing did not give chase, guessing that it was pinned to the floor. But still Chaska removed two charges from his backpack. He set them to the entrance roof of the caverns and he blew them. The cavern was sealed off and the creature could no longer escape. We returned and reported to our superiors that we could not find the marines and reported them as missing. From what I heard, missing cases in the area tend to not get solved due to certain circumstances. That's all I can say for now without giving away anything classified. But we still get reports from some marines that, in the middle of the night, they can still hear their missing comrades' voices coming from the desert, beckoning them to come and help them in the desert. We have passed word to ignore it, and even made up an excuse to discredit the voices saying that it's just the wind. I have more stories, but I've run out of time for now. I have to get back to work. Boss wants a report on what happened, and it's going to take all day to write it. I'll be in touch soon. I've decided to read two files from my old assignments. I've got to be quick though. I'm on schedule to go meet with Chaska tonight at the smoke pit. He didn't tell me what he wanted, but he didn't want anybody to know. He just wanted it to be me and him. The first report that I'll recount to you is an interview with a marine whose whole squad fell victim to an attack by an unidentified creature. For your safety, I'm going to leave out the location. We don't need anyone else getting hurt. Nor do we want people investigating the matter themselves. On November 17th, 2020, Lance Corporal, redacted, was found outside the gates of his base, collapsed. When examined, he was dehydrated, had severe bruising, and was unresponsive. He was rushed to the on-base clinic, where he was revived and all these severe wounds were treated. He was then escorted to the briefing room, where he was interviewed by Captain Redacted. The interview went as such. Good morning, Corporal. I'm with an investigation agency and we want to investigate what happened to you and your squad. So the commander of the base can act appropriately on the matter. So tell me everything that happened. And please, do not leave out a single detail. Everything you say will help us. Yes, sir. We arrived at Camp Redacted at 13.30. After a six-mile hike, we were tired so we set up camp four miles away from a mouth of a cave. We didn't know then, but the locals called this cave Harry Man's Cave. Many locals refused to go. Everyone had settled down for the night. Everyone but me. I was on fire watch, so I had to guard the perimeter of the base. Everything was going fine until in the distance. I saw something that appeared to be a man, but it didn't really fit the definition of it. It was tall with its head, dang near touching the lowest branch on a tree. It was covered in shaggy what I assumed to be dark hair, and it had eyes that glowed in the night. I comforted my eyes by reassuring myself that it was nothing but a little bit of sleep deprivation and nothing but my imagination. Just like as a kid, I had found nothing when I checked under my bed for the monster, or how I had discovered these scratching bees outside my bedroom were little more than the branches of an old tree. I was relieved of my duty at midnight, and I wondered if I should have told my replacement about the thing that I saw. But I didn't, due to not wanting to look like a maniac. I returned to my tent, and as I closed my eyes and curled up, trying to get rid of some of the chill from the cool night air, I kept telling myself that that thing I saw couldn't be real. That the idea of a hairy man just didn't make sense enough to manifest itself into reality. And then it happened. The guard could be heard yelling at something at the mouth of the cave. Halt there. Identify yourself. I peeked out through my hole in my tent and it was the same creature I had seen earlier. It was standing in front of the cave. In the blink of an eye, it ran out from the entrance of the cave. It mauled the poor guard, ripping all his limbs off effortlessly. It then saw me peeking through my tent, and it smashed into it with such force that it tore it apart. Terrified, I tried to get to my feet but I was powerless as the tent collapsed all around me, 
and the figure beat Don repeatedly. Heavy blows that eventually had knocked me unconscious. After what seemed like an eternity, I woke up to find myself laying in a dark cave. A large figure sitting opposite of me and watching with unblinking eyes that burned in the darkness. Frozen in terror, I stared at the figure for a few minutes, the stench of rotten meat. I already knew that some of those smells belonged to the bodies of my fallen brothers, and it began to make me feel sick, and I felt pain across my entire body. The figure then flashed a grotesque smile, showing iron teeth that were jagged and continually ground against each other, making a horrible sound in the process. The figure then proceeded to stand up, showing horribly long arms that began to drag across the ground as it came forward. Large feet showing toes that were gnarled and broken, having many more toes than an ordinary man. Not that I had longed to think on this before, a large hand reached over and grabbed me, tossing me over a hairy shoulder as I kicked and shouted in fear. The figure didn't even flinch as he carried me over its shoulder and out of the cave. I kicked and screamed for what seemed like hours as the hairy creature trotted along a worn path in the woods nearby, eventually tossing me to the ground and standing over me. Covered in mud, bruised and terrified, I scrambled to my feet and ran down the path, not daring to look back as I fled the area and stumbled my way back to the gate and succumbed to my injuries where the gate guards had found me. The second report comes from Redacted. This is an interview I did personally. It was an account from an eight-year-old girl. Her family was on a camping trip on base where her and her brother went to go play in the forest. The family grew worried after some time had passed and right when they were about to call the quits and send the rangers home, she came back, but her brother didn't. The interview went as such, and the girl had been given a false name to protect the family and her identity. She was being questioned by the rangers when my organization stepped in and took her away to get more details. The interview went as such. Hello, Annie. How's your day going today? Hello, mister. My day's going good. Me and mommy got ice cream before we left. It was really good. My favorite is Oreo. What's your favorite? That's a good choice, Annie. I would have to say my favorite is the special brand made by General Mills. It is based off of Lucky Charm, so it had marshmallows in it. I bet you would love it. I'll ask mom if I can try it one day. She said with excitement. So Annie, I'm here today to ask you about what happened to your brother. We need to know so we can find him and bring him back to you and your family. Do you think you can help me out with that? She looks to the ground with the previous smile draining from her face. You're not going to find him. He lost the game and the woman won't let him go. What woman? He went with the woman with the scary face. We were playing hide and seek. When the woman said that she wanted to play... She answered it like it was the most normal thing in the world. I thought she may have been in some sort of emotional distress, but she didn't show any symptoms. Annie, when you mentioned her face, what did you mean? Her face was like a barn owl on a woman's face. She was tall and slender and she even had feathers on her arms. She could even fly and she offered us a ride. Okay, so what happened when you started playing with her? She said she would hide in that we needed to find her. We walked into the woods and she jumped down from a branch of a tree and said, Peekaboo, and started to fly after us saying that she was going to eat us. We started to cry because she had scared us. She said that she was only joking. She promised and crossed her heart and hoped to die. And so we started playing again. And then what happened to Annie? She said that it was our turn to hide and that she would give us 100 seconds, and then she would come to find us. We didn't know where we were now, so we just ran into the trees. I hit behind a rock, but it wasn't big enough for the two of us, so my brother went the other way. I heard the woman say, Ready or not, here I come. What happened after that? 
I came back and talked to the men with the funny tan hats on. And my parents, they were really happy to see me. Annie, why did you come back and your brother didn't? Because she didn't find me. Her eyes then went from focusing on me to focusing on the window, and they grew big and she gasped. Annie, what's wrong? Nothing, it's just, I think I've said too much. Can I go home now? Her mother was called and Annie was sent home and I thanked her for her cooperation. 48 hours later, she was reported missing. Investigators said her bedroom window was smashed from the outside using a big rock. The dogs couldn't find her scent. And all they had were a regular sized feathers on the rooftop and a large owl pellet behind the house containing clothing that they last saw her brother in. Every occupant on that base was moved, and the base was shut down and sectioned off from the rest of the world. Families living around the area say in the dead of the night they can hear the flapping of wings over their houses, only to find very large feathers in the morning. That's all I got for now. The screen is making my eyes hurt. I'm gonna go chill by the smoke pit and look at the stars. I'll catch you guys later. Let me start things off by saying that I've never truly been into the idea of secret government agencies or entities working behind the scenes like the Men in Black. But what happened tonight, and what I've become a part of, has changed that today. It all started when me and Chaska were throwing around a football, a brotherly bonding, he says. When the base alarm goes off, and military vehicles full of guards armed to the teeth are going down the street. The base alarm was initiated, and an officer came over the base intercom saying, Lockdown, lockdown, this is not a drill. Everyone to their respective barracks room, double time. Me and Chaska spent no time running back to our rooms, but not before I threw the football one good time hitting him square in the back of the head, and he fell on his face. Oh, what the? Tag, you're it. I'm gonna remember that one. He said while laughing childishly, and running to his room. Once I was at my room, I closed my door and I got a message from my superior. I have an assignment for you. This is an out of the ordinary assignment, but you proved yourself to be capable enough to take any hard task on. I have emailed you an encrypted email of where to go tonight to investigate the disappearances of marines. I've got to go close the base down so no one will get in the way of your investigation. Be safe and be heavily armed. Huh, I thought to myself, that's strange. I then went to my laptop and opened up my email to see coordinates to the location that I was going. I packed food just in case I got hungry and went to the armory to get a high powered weapon. A sword that was mounted on the wall. I took it because it looked really cool. And grenades in less than five minutes, I was on my way. My GPS took me to a site unfamiliar to me. But the site was all too brutal. It took me to a campsite that was absolutely destroyed. Searching the site went as expected given past events. It was completely derelict. Nothing in the dunes around me was making a single sound. There was only pure, dead silence. Whatever came through there did a pretty good job accounting of itself. Tents were ripped as if they had been through a paper shredder multiple times, and were subsequently put into a blender. Droplets of red were everywhere, staining the surrounding rocks and what remained of the tents. A mangled body of a man, littered with large gashes and bite marks, lay a few feet away from the fire, dead campfire. I'm not the one for fairy tales and stuff, but this sounded exactly like a skinwalker attack. The skinwalkers are Navajo witches or warlocks capable of utilizing black magic to shapeshift into animals, either through possession or disguising by flaying the pelt off the animal and draping it over them, like some sort of demented suit of flesh and skin. And as I expected, that very method can be done to humans. From head to toe, his skin had been removed, usually in a very crude fashion, exposing layers and layers of peeled back flesh, lacerated muscles, and exposed tendons. He was severely injured in appearance, as death by a skinwalker is not a clean one. 
Dang, this guy got messed up pretty bad, said a random voice. I turned to see where the voice was coming from, and to my relief, it was Chaska. What are you doing here? You looked like you were about to go have some fun, and I figured, hey, why don't I tag along? I've got nothing else to do on this Friday night. I thought to myself and then decided to myself to let him come along. It looked like he had brought some weapons as well. After we were done studying the body, Chaska grabbed me by the back of my shirt and pulled me behind a rock. What are you doing? He put his hand over my mouth. His hands were sweating and his eyes were big. He motioned with his other hand to look over the rock. And what I saw was truly terrifying. It was a man. No, not a man. Something that simply mimicked the human form. It stood well over seven feet and had antlers the size of a moose on its head. It had long arms with long claws at the end. Its eyes burned bright yellow, and the stench that came from its body was so wretched that if I didn't have a hand over my mouth, I would have vomited. It sniffed the air and then walked over to the body. Its gait that it walked with was disturbing. It walked as if one leg was longer than the other. It grabbed the marine's foot and dragged him into the desert towards the mouth of a cave. Once it was far enough away from me, Chaska and I looked at each other and knew that we had to make a plan. This was a skinwalker but like animals, this was a different species. This species from what I could tell was bigger and stronger than your average skinwalker. So the plan had to be solid to take this thing down. And that was when a light bulb flashed in my head. I had it. From my bag, I pulled out a football. What the heck, you still got that from earlier? Yup, and I've got a plan. You see, here's what we're gonna do. I described the plan to Chaska, and he nodded. But I could tell that he was a bit worried about it. At 0300 hours, we started, Chaska and I made a lot of noise outside of the cave. Throwing the football back and forth and then on purpose, I threw it into the mouth of the cave. Come on, dude. That was way too far. I'll go get it. Chaska then switched the regular football with an homemade explosive just in time. From the mouth of the cave came out the skinwalker wearing the marine skin. A horrid, mangled mess was limping out of the cave. Its face looked like a mask that didn't fit well at all. Its posture was slumped over and hunched back. Worst of all was its voice. God, its voice sounded like a thousand whispers echoing inside of our heads. I prayed that Chaska would keep us cool. To be honest, he was doing a better job than I was. Oh, hey man, I haven't seen you in forever. You mind throwing the football back to me? I didn't mean to bother you. He said while looking up at the creature and nervously chuckling. In a horrid howl, it said the mangled words. Sure, let me help you. It reached down to grab the football. All right, man, I'll go long. Just throw it when you're ready. Chaska then started running, as if he was running for a pass, and as soon as he was far enough, he detonated the football. It was really a handmade explosive filled up with silver and wolf's bane. The skinwalker howled in pain, and it ripped its skin off. In a fit of rage, it ripped off a stalagmite and threw it at Chaska, hitting his right arm. He fell to the ground, yelling in pain. Open fire. I lit the creature up, but I could tell that my gun wasn't doing anything. Chaska noticed it too, and he kicked me a clip of ammo with glimmering bullets in it. I took fire, and the creature started to show pain. The bullets shined in the night, and it made me realize that they weren't ordinary bullets, but they were silver. He knew what the thing's weakness was, and he knew exactly what to put in the explosive when I brought the idea up to him. After five minutes, the creature was done. I ran over and checked on Casca. His right arm had been nearly cut off from the skinwalker. I wrapped his arm as best as I could, and then he pulled a radio from his pocket and spoke with someone on the other line in codes that I couldn't understand. Cheska, what's going on, man? Is there something you need to tell me? I didn't want you to find out like this, but... I'm part of a secret government agency that hunts monsters like this on the regular. We are higher ranking than the FBI and the CIA. Not many people know that we even exist. But our name is Redacted. 
When we first encountered that when I go together, you displayed skills and planning that were capable of making you a high-ranking member of our organization. This hunt solidified the idea, and someone would like to talk to you. Within five minutes, a helicopter landed on the ground, followed by two all-black military vehicles. A group of men got out and wrapped the skinwalker in a tarp and placed it in the back of one of the cars. From the helicopter, a large man walked out. He was tall and had very black hair. On his collar were three stars and in a loud booming voice, he greeted me. Hello, I've heard a lot about you from Chaska. You did some fine work here. Uh, thank you, sir, but what's going on here? Why are you taking the skinwalker away instead of getting rid of it? I'm sure you know that this is no ordinary skinwalker. It's a variant that needs to be studied to help understand the species, and how to understand how it works to prevent any more cases like this from happening. I'm sure Chaska would agree with me that if it wasn't for you, then we would have more bodies on our hands than just one. So, uh, I would like to invite you to join our organization. As a Chaska's partner, what do you say? Are you in? I pondered and thought to myself, am I really cut out to be in this organization? I then looked at Chaska who was smiling and giving me a thumbs up with his one good arm. I then said, yes sir, I would be honored to join. Very well, I'll do the paperwork and talk to your superiors as soon as I get done with the skinwalker. Until then, look after Chaska while he recovers. I know he's a lot to handle sometime. If only you knew, sir. Hey, think fast. I turned to see a perfect spiral football heading towards my face. I wasn't quick enough to dodge it, and it nailed me right in the nose. I fell to the ground, stunned. You see, brother, I told you I wouldn't forget. He extended his good arm out to help me up, and I took it. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I was ready to start my new job, hunting the things that go bump in the night.